praise and sing my refuge and my rock in whom I trust. There is room for all. There is room for As we acknowledge the land this morning, I wonder if you'll join me in a prayer prepared by Indigenous elders. Creator God, we ask you to be with us. We pray for those who are ill, for those we cannot be with as closely as we wish. When we are afraid, help us to remember and be grateful for water, which gives life for the land which sustains us and restores us to health. Help us to be grateful for the wisdom of elders who guide us, our young people who deserve a bright future, and for our strength and resilience which will bring us a new day. Help our leaders to respond appropriately to the specific needs of Indigenous communities. Help us to walk compassionately with all who are ill or afraid and help us to understand that we are all relatives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
And as we pray in Jesus' name, we light this candle in Jesus' name. And may this be a reminder to continue moving prayerfully through this service and through our lives. And so we welcome you. All those who are home are gathered, connected to those who are worshiping. Now is a great time to call or text a friend and say, tune in and let's worship God together. For you are welcome and this place extends way beyond the walls of the building to be the church of Jesus Christ. So welcome to Islington United. We are a community of people who don't think the same, vote the same, love the same, but we are working to follow Jesus on the way. And so I invite you to this time of worship to sing along at the top of your lungs or just be still and know that God is in this place and where you are. Let's worship God together with the assurance that Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hello and good morning. My name is Michelle and I am the Children and Families Ministry Coordinator here at Islington United Church. I now would like to invite all of our children and young ones for a time of godly play with Amy and myself following the service at 12 o'clock. You can email me at michelle at islingtonunited.org to receive the Zoom link in order to participate. We look forward to spending time with our familiar faces and extend a warm welcome to any new children and families who are interested in joining us. Thanks so much and we look forward to seeing you soon. The ancient words of Psalm 121 speak into this time today. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, God who made heaven and earth. God will not let our feet be moved. God who keeps you will not slumber. God who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. God will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. These words of comfort and strength, they call us to remember to light lights this morning for those we are holding in our prayers, those we have lost and those we are grieving, those who are part of the cloud of witnesses that are with us with each breath, those we miss and who've taught us about love and shared with us their questions and their doubts. We light these candles in honor of those who have shown us the way of faith, those who have been light in our lives. And that light, well, it reminds us of the words of Jesus, peace be with you, do not be afraid. On the second Sunday in Easter, we often tell the story of Doubting Thomas. But even more, it comes to us this Sunday. For we remember how one night in Jerusalem, the disciples gathered in a room with the door shut. They were afraid that the soldiers would come and take them like they had Jesus. Someone said, peace be with you. They looked up and it was Jesus. At first they thought it was a ghost, but then he talked with them. They saw his wounds, 
He ate a piece of fish and opened the scriptures to them. Finally, he said again, peace be with you, and he was gone. Thomas had been away that night, so when they told him the next day, he did not believe them. He had doubt in his bones. I won't believe until I can touch his wounds. And why wouldn't he doubt? Their minds were stretching to be big enough to know Jesus in this new way. Eight days passed. The disciples gathered again in the room with the doors shut. This time Thomas was there. A voice said, peace be with you. It was he. And this time he went right up to Thomas and held out his hands and said, touch my wounds. All Thomas could do was fall on his knees. Jesus looked at him a long time and smiled. He then slowly looked around the whole circle and said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Herein lies good news. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So you're out for a walk, just stretching your legs. See if you can picture this with me. It's nice to be out. You've been feeling a bit cooped up lately. Feels good to have the sun on your shoulders, a breeze gently stirring the atmosphere. Seasons are changing. It smells like somebody might be barbecuing. Hmm. You feel hopeful. In the distance, you see a man out walking his dog, gradually approaching you. As you get a bit closer, you see that the man is coughing. It seems like he might be sick. Quickly, you cross to the other side of the street, keeping your distance. Now, why do you do this? Do you know this man has COVID-19, the coronavirus? Do you know that he will make you sick? Can you see his germs? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I realize Jesus' words may seem a bit silly in this context, but in our global pandemic right now, we are seeing the interplay, the interplay of faith and doubt. Many of us, most I hope, believe in the danger of COVID-19, even though very few of us have personally directly seen it. Most of us have only seen the danger mediated through the news and other sources. So we believe even though we have not seen. We have faith in our doctors and scientists who are dealing with this virus. We have faith in our leaders trying to keep us as safe as possible. In this case, obviously acting on doubt could prove harmful to others. If we doubt the virus just because we don't see it, and behave as if it's not real, we can do a lot of harm. But the doubt itself is not at fault. It's the conclusions that we can jump to which can be dangerous. Doubt itself is calling out for further learning. Doubt is asking, seeking, yearning to know. There's a lot that we're feeling unsure about right now. It makes sense to have doubt about our future. And we don't have to feel bad because we feel doubt. What we might discover, in fact, is that doubt and faith can work together. As the mystic poet Khalil Gibran puts it, doubt is a pain too lonely to know that faith is his twin brother. We can have faith and doubt. One doesn't rule the other one out. Thomas is not bad or wrong because he has doubt. And he is not without faith just because he doubts what his friends have told him. Jesus does not love him any less. Many of Thomas's friends would likely join him in his doubt had they not already seen Jesus the week before. 
And you can imagine Thomas is feeling pretty sad. He just buried his teacher, his mentor, his Lord, whom he loved dearly. He isn't in the mood for joy and celebration. So you can understand his disbelief when his friends come to him and say, we have seen the Lord. His sadness is so all-consuming that it won't give way easily, not to mere words. Unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. John's gospel tells us that a week passes before Jesus appears to them again. And I wonder about that week between. After Thomas declares his doubt, what is the rest of that week like for him? Is Thomas stewing in his disbelief? Is he apathetic? Is he able to continue grieving Jesus' death with that news now hovering over him? Maybe he goes out to challenge his friends and anyone they are talking to, trying to convince others to join him in his doubt. Or maybe his doubt sharpens his senses, calling his heart to attention. I don't know. But I do know what it is to doubt, of course. I often have more than I care to share. I have my doubts about this sermon. I have my doubts about whether I can get the message across. I even have my doubts about what the message is. Should I admit that? I don't know. There it is. My dad shared with me this week that when he was preaching on Doubting Thomas once, he was drawn to the courage Thomas had to share his doubt. Thomas took a risk in asking questions, in seeking answers. Our world certainly has a lot of doubt, and especially right now. That's obvious, and it's understandable. But there's also a dangerous level of certainty, I feel. When faced with doubt, there's a part of us that desperately grasps after any little scrap of certainty. We want to feel solid ground beneath us. And if the world we knew before no longer appears stable, we may even try to create a sense of certainty, perhaps even deluding ourselves. This kind of belief, unchecked by doubt, can actually do a lot of harm. There are leaders in the world, some not far from here, bloated with their own certainty, so sure of themselves that doubt has no space to allow for reflection on their actions, let alone their values. Without some doubt, we can become trapped in egoic cycles, endlessly defending ourselves and our actions, never pausing to actually consider how we impact others. In a time like right now, this sort of certainty has dangerous implications. When national leaders, community leaders, even some celebrities question efforts to limit the spread of this virus, or worse, become cemented in their perspective, unwilling to listen and reflect, unwilling to doubt themselves, they're putting all of us at greater risk. We can understand, of course, the allure of certainty, the attraction to a leader who seems so sure of themselves. But I sense that the doubt we are all experiencing now is not calling us to action. It's calling us to reflection. And with this confusing mixture of certainty, doubt, faith, questions, answers, we might wonder, what's happening? Who is actually in charge here? Jesus loves Thomas. He doesn't turn him away. After wishing peace upon them all, Jesus comes to Thomas specifically and says, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Much earlier, Jesus calls us to ask, seek, knock. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. These actions don't come from a full belief or a full faith, asking, seeking, knocking. They come much more from doubt, but they can deepen our faith, 
allowing God to more fully reveal God's presence to us. In this way, God wills our return to his presence. Jesus loves Thomas through his doubt, knowing, as Thomas does, we each have our own path to walk. Faith is both the road and the goal. And through our prayer life, especially in the midst of uncertainty and doubt, God opens this door to us. Presence deepens faith. Presence is both the path and the purpose. Our presence is rooted in God's presence. If you've been following occasionally on the meditations that I share most days, every day but Sunday, I've been coming back to this scripture that in God we live and move and have our very being. Our presence is rooted in God's presence. And doubt as a companion to faith can force us onto this solid ground of reality. Right now, presence. Instead of building upon the temporary stability of the world, we can invest in the undeniable, the sacred ground of this moment. God willing us to her presence. In the Gospel of Thomas, an ancient scripture not included in the biblical canon, The disciples asked Jesus, tell us, how will our end come? Jesus replies, have you found the beginning then, that you are looking for the end? You see, the end will be where the beginning is. Congratulations to the one who stands at the beginning. That one will know the end and will not taste death. This calls up for me at least the powerful and perhaps paradoxical words of Francis of Assisi. The one you are looking for is the one who is looking. The one you are looking for is the one who is looking. What you are looking for is where you are looking from. And looking at the world right now, we are seeing people come together When so much has fallen away from our days, from our usual routines, God is bringing us closer together and bringing us closer to our true priorities. And the more we invite God into our lives and our actions, God guides us, shining light on our path, bringing hope. In spite of some confused people and leadership, God is inspiring those who are able to help others in simple and safe ways, in new and creative ways, showing our solidarity, our shared humanity. God is loving us through this time of uncertainty. And like Thomas, we can be courageous in our doubt, not hiding behind false certainty, but awake to the wonder of life. And when we think about it, doubt is not too far from wonder. In fact, doubt is all about wonder. How? Why? When? Doubt wants to know. In this light, doubt opens us up. No longer slumbering in the safety of our certainties, we become alert, attentive to the movement of life, of God's Spirit. And as God plants doubt in some of the things that we once trusted— temporary worldly things not worthy of a deep and abiding faith, space is then opened up within us to more deeply invest our hearts in God, our true home. And God loves us whether or not we doubt, whether or not we believe, whether or not we see the wounds in Jesus' flesh. God loves us right where we are, and all the way through our journeys. The only thing that changes is our awareness of that love. It deepens and ripens as our faith grows, developing our confidence and our inclination to share this good news with one one another. And along the way, our doubt can actually fuel and refine our faith. This, too, is good news. 
And so I wonder if you'll join me as we close with prayer, the prayer of another Thomas, who also dealt with his fair share of doubt and let it refine his faith. A prayer of Thomas Merton. My Lord God, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end. Nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if, if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will not fear, for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. May it be so. Amen. Continue in the spirit of prayer. Let us pray. O 
Holy One, we come to you with open hearts, seeking and asking for your wisdom, joining our hearts with others in prayer, aware of each of our own stories. We come aware of your presence in our lives. We reach out in prayer to those we aren't with in person, with those we're walking with in our hearts. We offer prayers for those who are sick, for those who are grieving and who've lost loved ones just this past few weeks. Those are who are remembering anniversaries and loved ones lost at other times. God, with the sound of the bird song, we turn our hearts to the prayers of our whole world, of creation yearning and growing and changing in this time, of signs of new life speaking into our wonderings, our questions, our doubts. We pray into this time that opens us to creativity, to being moved from certainty and a place of rightness, to listen differently and reflect. Because we are encountering you on this way, we're hearing your invitation to reach out and notice. And in the midst of suffering, in the midst of our own brokenness, we find you. We give thanks for those who accompany us on this way, those frontliners who are in the places we can't be physically, who are offering care and words of peace and hope, the therapists and the doctors, the nurses, the caregivers, the behind-the-scenes workers who are offering care at all hours of the day. God, we turn to you for fuel in the midst of this. We bring our faith and our doubts as seekers on your way. We pray into the losses of this time, connecting with the loss the disciples had felt, with those whose plans are canceled, those whose jobs are being held or have disappeared, those who collectively are feeling grief of an old way of life gone and the new way not yet glimpsed. And so we sit with Thomas and the disciples. We wonder, we listen, and we remember that the risen one taught them to pray. And so we sing the words that were taught so long ago that connect us to those praying together today. Let's sing that prayer that Jesus taught us together now.
And so my friends, I wanna say thank you for all the ways that you're leaning into your doubt of the days to come by being generous, by helping us to support each other and offer worship and pastoral care in this community and this time. We're grateful that what we're offering in Christ's name is reaching out to others, not only in our own community and beyond. There's so many ways to continue to give to be courageous in this time, virtually and through e-transfer to the office at islingtonunited.org to continue to place checks in the mail or drop them off in the Narthex mail slot. But this time of offering is an act of compassion and care. For this is, we are grateful. And thank you to Jennifer for calling us into further reflection. Let's share together our offering prayer. Holy One, 
Bless our offerings and transform them into compassion for others, into community for the lonely, and hope for the church and the world. Amen. Before we sing our departing song together, I want to invite you to stay after the service and just scroll a little bit down further on the website so that we can have a time of passing the peace and sharing the news of our community and beyond. You can also join us on Facebook Live if you'd like to be part of commenting and adding your thoughts to that time. There's much happening that the website keeps us as a church family connected to this week. James mentioned his three o'clock meditations, but don't miss the Tuesday and Thursday piano meditations that come from Jason. And there's more being offered as we figure out how to be the church at this time. And each Wednesday and Friday, you'll receive Wednesday an email connected to the governance and the things that are happening from the leaders in our congregation and the message of what will be offered in the week ahead on Friday from myself know that if you have an idea, we'd love to know what might meet the needs of our community in this time. We'll continue to do the work and worship of the church together. Let's sing together that promise, we shall go out with hope of resurrection. Go from this place carrying the light of Christ. May the grace of Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Go in peace. Amen.